To get us to that point of having 3 billion humanoids over the next 60 years, what are the analogs for the manufacturing of robotics? How can we look at this and make the dots connect? Well, one of the things that I've been looking at is that industrial robots, even with exponential growth, that's still not sophisticated enough for what we're looking at. Those six degrees of freedom robots are stuck in safety cages. They might be fast at doing precision work, but as our last speaker said, they're not adaptable. They're not very intelligent, and they aren't suitable for work in anything outside of a highly structured environment. We need more sophisticated robots, and they are vastly more complex. We're looking at agile, dexterous, and intelligent robots, and that's where humanoids are what we're talking about very often. And that's 26 degrees of freedom or more, vastly more complicated. However, how can we, what are some of the, the ways we can think about the production of other physical goods that are becoming increasingly smart? So, okay, there's only 3 million industrial robots in the world, but there are 60 million robot vacuum cleaners. And that only took 20 years. Maybe closest is the automobile. There are now 1.5 billion of them in the world, but guess what? We started building commercial cars in 1890, well before the Model T production line. It took 100 years for us to go from one to one billion. Automotive is still a very good analog for humanoid robots though, uh, and we can fact check this against something else like the personal computing device. Then we can decompose this and say, what are the things that are involved in a humanoid system? And look at the bill of materials compared to things like personal computing devices or modern automobiles, which increasingly have more than 50 sensors, more than 200 computing chips, lots of battery technologies, Bank of America has done a nice little teardown of what is the manufacturability of a humanoid robot. And Jeff Cardenas from Aptronic talks about how he can understand building humanoids by looking at the automotive industry. And that the bill of materials is very similar, but should be about one third to one quarter more affordable than the bill of materials for an automobile. The thing that is significantly different between humanoids and all the other technologies that I talked about is the actuator technology. If you have 26 degrees of freedom, you have 26 actuators very frequently. Uh, actuators are the most complex and the most costly part of building a humanoid robot. Now, We've come a long way in reducing the cost of computing, reducing the cost of sensors, reducing the cost of battery technology. What is exciting is how many companies are working on the space, first of hand technologies, dexterous technologies, but secondly, of the motor technology and the gearing technologies. So there are quite a few unique pathways being explored but here's a little bit of a secret. How do you know what a top humanoid company is? I'm currently tracking about 140 humanoid robotics companies. One really good indicator is they're on stage with Jensen Wang. But you know the next best indicator of who is a really good humanoid robot company? Did they start out as an actuator company? One X did. Aptronic did, Unitree did, Fourier did. These are all companies whose core competence relates to building the most complex and costly part of a humanoid robot. I think that's a really good indicator for knowing who's going to move the needle in the robotic space. You know another really good um, indicator Elon Musk talks about how Optimus is going to be great because of Tesla's manufacturing experience in automotive manufacturing. 
Well, Tesla is not the only automotive company that is planning on building humanoid robots. BYD has opened their humanoid robot division. And I've heard that quite a number of the other automotive companies are heading in this direction too. What a change. The automotive industry is the primary purchaser of robots. And they are now looking at becoming the primary providers or producers of robots. I think that's kind of interesting. So David said, Silicon Valley Robotics started in 2010 and our mission was supporting innovation and commercialization of robotics technologies. And I can guarantee you in 2010, this robotics space did not look anything like what it looks like today. And I'm a fan of the five-year plan. I think it's working really well for China, uh, maybe less so for Stalin Russia, but the five-year plan predates the Stalin's regime. It's been used successfully in many countries. So we said, what is the five-year plan for robots in 2010? It's like, there's no investment into this technology. And we see an increasing number of early stage companies. So we need to increase the amount of investment and we need to increase the investability of these robotic startups. And by 2015, I had venture firms cold calling us saying, we've got a thesis on robotics when they laughed at us five years earlier. The actual global investment in robotics was reaching more than $1 billion. And we were looking ahead to say, what is the next thing that this emerging robotics industry needs? So our next five-year plan focused on building bridges out to the market areas because robotics was spreading well away from this industrial robot model, which sold primarily into the automotive industry and factories. We were looking at mobile robots, service robots, robots coming into agricultural robots, space robots, construction robots, mining robots, robots potentially moving into every industry. And that meant creating better bridges to those markets. But our current five-year plan has been following this through and saying, if there is such a need for robots, and if we've increased the investment into launching these companies, the big question is, how are we going to supply the robots? Who is going to build them? And where are they going to build them? So our focus has been on growing the manufacturing capacity at a startup level and at a facility level and at a partnerships level. Uh, if I've got time, this one... Oh, it's playing. This is the world's first humanoid robot factory. This has never been done before. Okay, I'm going to talk over the top of that because the sound's not really great. But this is a jewelry in robotics. They launched just two years ago the world's first humanoid robot factory in Salem, Oregon, at uh, approximately 70,000 square feet, with a planned capacity of 10,000 robots per year. I've just come back from China where I toured Unitree's factory as well. And these are leading companies. I will tell you that as of today, I would say that the global capacity, we've maybe got 10,000 humanoid robots out there in the world, maybe. But I went out on a limb a couple of years ago and I said, we will have 1 million by the end of 2030. And uh, just this year, I think Bank of America or one of the other experts came in and said, one million humanoids by 2030. So I think my math is still pretty good. But the beauty of this is that we will be building robots that will be building robots. But at the same time, we will be building capacity in many, many other industries. And we will be building jobs. And we will be building them in the United States, not just in China or other parts of the world. I'm really excited to see the development of manufacturing of robots in the United States. And one of the things that we did back in 2017 was partner with Circuit Launch, which is a co-work facility for robotics, hardware, biotech, deep tech companies. And the first facility in Oakland, 33,000 square feet, is now home to more than 100 companies that are going from one to 1,000. This is not purely about prototyping. This is about small batch manufacturing. It's supporting you through that journey 
while you develop your large-scale manufacturing competencies. And indeed, we've been the beachhead for a number of companies from overseas into the United States, including 1X and a number of other well-known humanoid companies. So not only uh, have I been working out of circuit launch and creating an environment for robotics acceleration there, we've now opened our second location at the start of this year in Mountain View. And maybe this time next year, we'll be, um, I'll be able to talk to you about uh, two other locations around the Bay Area, if not uh, some other locations overseas. Creating a larger network that is accelerating a small batch manufacturing stage for our deep tech companies. <coughs> we spend a lot of time growing the investability of companies. And we have all, there's a lot of global expertise in manufacturing millions, but we desperately need support in the early stages to go from one to a thousand. And so I'm very excited about working with Circuit Launch. And let's just finish off with the whole robo-apocalypse thing. The World Economic Forum is not actually too worried. Their projections for the next five years show that for every job that is displaced, two more jobs will be created. And this is exactly what we have seen in the history of technology rollouts, because the downstream effect of increased technology, improved productivity, enhanced wealth, which downstream created more jobs. But even directly, if we look at the automotive industry, and India is a great example, because 30 years ago, we didn't really think much about India in terms of manufacturing automobiles, but they are now in the top three globally, producing 30 million vehicles a year, which have created 30 million jobs. So when I think about the robo-apocalypse, I think, what a wonderful time to be in the robotics industry. We can finally create commercially useful robots across almost any industry at a comparatively affordable price and not only will they be doing good work in the world, pretty much every robot we create will create a job for a human. What's not to love about that? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.